We're starting today a new series of doctrinal sermons in the run-up to Easter, uh, spending time going through Romans chapter 8, uh, of which chapter uh, the late John Stott wrote these words. Without doubt, one of the best-known, best-loved chapters of the Bible. Uh, on this Foundation Sunday, uh, we, of course, celebrate our founders who organised and raised money to plant this church, Jesmond Parish Church, in 1861 to be a central point for the maintenance and promulgation of sound scriptural and evangelical truth. And I'm sure they, uh, together with Richard Clayton, in whose memory the church was founded, would have approved of this uh, series of studies as seeking to teach sound scriptural and evangelical truth. So we start this morning with uh, Romans 8, uh, verses 1 to 4, which I'll now read and then pray. Uh, Romans 8, 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So uh, let's now pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word through the Apostle Paul. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will now open your, our hearts and our minds to hear what you are saying to us at the beginning of this new year, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And I have just two headings this morning. First, the context, and secondly, the content. So first, the context. And I want to outline the context that comes from chapters 1 to 6, and then secondly, uh, I want to under outline uh, chapter 7. So first, chapters 1 to 6. In chapters 1 to 3 of Romans, Paul starts off by showing how sin is the main human problem. Uh, he shows how salvation from sin is needed for uh, sexually depraved secularists, then uh, for their judgmental, hypocritical critics, and uh, then for the sins of the self-confident orthodox. So all have sinned as measured by the fact that we all fall short of the glory of God. That's chapter 3, verse 23. But the good news is that we can then, then get right with God by faith in Jesus Christ who died bearing the penalty our sins deserve. So Paul writes of Christ, chapter 3, verse 25, as the one whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And the benefits of that atonement or justification were to be received by faith alone and not because of any good works, the good we do, as proved in chapter 4 by Abraham's situation. So then chapter 5 can say, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, then next in Romans, in the second half of chapter 5 and chapter 6, you have two humanities described. Uh, one is with Adam and as its head, and uh, with whom sin began in the human race. And the other is, of course, with Christ as its head, and with whom uh, resurrection life began that first Easter. And as we have faith in Christ, as witnessed uh, in baptism, we, in union with Christ, share not only in his death, but also in his resurrection life. Uh, and as we will be hearing later, that experience of resurrection life is enabled by the Holy Spirit, whom Paul in chapter 1 has already associated with the resurrection of Jesus. For in verse 4 of chapter 1, he says, Jesus Christ our Lord was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. And that resurrection power, implies Paul, should affect our lifestyles. But it's not automatic, for we still have the remains of our fallen nature from Adam. Uh, 
Uh, so the believer has always to obey two commands. Chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, put it like this. So one, you must consider yourselves, that's something you have to think about in your mind. You have to consider, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So two, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You have to exercise your will. Well, so much for the context of Romans 1 to 6. Now, secondly, and the immediate context of chapter 8 is namely uh, chapter 7. Uh, and we had that read to us, some of that. And chapter 7 is important because it speaks of the normal Christian life, this side of heaven. It speaks of the spiritual warfare that's going on all the time and that chapter 6 implied. It's, of course, not the spiritual warfare talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 12, where he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, this is the spiritual warfare that is going on in the human heart and uh, particularly uh, the Christian's heart or their inner self. And the war, war is between what Paul calls the flesh on the one hand in the sense uh, of uh, the leftover of Adam's old nature of sin and death. On the other hand, there is the spirit, which is uh, the Holy Spirit together uh, with uh, the Christian's new resurrection life. This, the Holy Spirit, brings to the individual believer's own life when they first trusted Christ. Also, Paul points out that the law, God's law, can provoke disobedience and so more conflict. Chapter 7, verse 5 says this, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law, like children being, little children being told don't, who immediately then do, um, uh, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But the Holy Spirit's new life helps to free us from that desire for lawlessness because we see how good is God's law for us. Chapter 7, uh, verse 6, puts it like this. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. But uh, Paul is not blaming the law for sin. Uh, no, it's our flesh, our fallen human nature, he argues, that is the problem. Well, so much for something on chapter 7 and the context of chapter 8. Now, we uh, secondly need to discuss the content of Romans 8 and verses 1 to 4. As we'll see, Paul uh, in chapter 8 is focusing on the Holy Spirit. And in our verses, which form the introduction to the chapter, Paul sets out two things. First, the facts, and then secondly, their explanation. So first, the facts as expressed in verses 1 and 2. He writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The therefore uh, there is based on all that has been taught in the previous seven chapters. So all the context that I have outlined. And the first fact is that there is, as translated, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, no condemnation is in the original, it's not quite the same as being justified. Being justified means a judgment of not guilty. In our courts, it's what the jury decide. No condemnation, however, implies the sentence the judge decides. So in terms of God, in this context, we're free from the sentence of death now and more seriously, eternal death in the final judgment. But note the fact that no condemnation is not a universal acquittal of everyone. Yet that is contrary to what some today want to believe. However, Paul is not implying uh, a God who is a universal Father Christmas. No, he is clear. Verse 1 says simply, there is therefore now no condemnation 
that those who are in Christ Jesus. But what does uh, being in Christ Jesus mean? Uh, well, in the New Testament, you believe into or upon. That's the literal translation of the original prepositions, but not in Christ Jesus. However, once you've trusted yourself to Christ, you are then, quote, in Christ. You are united with him. And also note the evidence that there is no condemnation is stated in verse 2. For the law, perhaps in the sense of the law's regular working, um, the law of the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit is now with you, the believer, to help you fight those temptations from the law or the regular working of sin and death. Simple temptations to sin. Oh yes, the war still goes on, but the believer has a new power to resist the principle of sin and death or the flesh principle. So there's no condemnation for the believer and at the same time, following that verdict, they have a new power in their life. Well, they are the facts uh, that's, uh, uh, spelled out, that are spelled out in verse 1. Do you believe them? Well, if you don't, Paul secondly explains why you can. Uh, so uh, look now at verses 3 and 4. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You'll notice there that there is a threefold aspect to this explanation. For God the Holy Trinity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit are all at work. First, uh, verse 3a, God the Father has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. But what is God's law that is weakened? Well, God's requirement for the best for human beings, the law in that sense, is sufficiently clear uh, in the Bible. To quote Jim Packer, it is embodied in the precepts and prohibitions of the Decalogue, expounded and applied by the prophets, the apostles and Christ himself, and displayed in the biblical biographies of men and women who pleased God with Christ himself, whose life from this standpoint could be described as the law incarnate, standing at the head of the list. As Paul tells us, and as we heard in our lesson uh, and chapter 7 verses 12 uh, and 14, the law in this sense is holy and righteous and good. But the law, even in that sense, God's divine law, is still powerless. Uh, yes, it can tell us what God wants, but by itself he can't make, it can't make sinners into saints. For you can't have a code for ev every eventuality. And uh, always motives, purposes and attitudes for the person acting can be hidden. So secondly, God the Son provided the solution. That's uh, 3b. God the Father, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Uh, the, that is a little complicated, but the words and for sin in the Greek and in the Greek Old Testament form the regular phrase for a sin offering. Uh, and uh, uh, so through uh, that sin offering, God condemned sin in the flesh. And so that difficult phrase seems to mean Christ's human nature, his flesh, his body, suffered the condemnation for all sin. So Christ has fully borne the condemnation we deserve. And in that way, God's great plan was now possible to begin, as thirdly, verse 4 tells us. For the Father's plan of Christ, the Son, being a sin offering, and bearing our sins condemnation in his flesh and so bringing us back into fellowship with himself was, verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there was now, after Pentecost, new power to strengthen believers after sending of the Holy Spirit, to live more in line with the righteous requirement of the law, God's law. But we shouldn't be surprised because that is what God had predicted through the Old Testament prophets, such as Ezekiel. For example, in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, say this, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And note uh, Paul does not say here, God condemns sin in Jesus in order that the righteous requirement uh, of the law might be fulfilled for us by Jesus. But he says, in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul is teaching at some length what Peter famously taught in one sentence in 1 Peter 2 verse 23. He, that is Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? Well, the answer is that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Of course, this side of death, we can't justify ourselves by fulfilling God's law. Of course, our lives need to be guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And of course, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, as listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, take time to grow. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So how then, at the beginning of this new year, should we respond to the challenge of these verses practically in respect of our own godly living, which is uh, one of our three goals at JPC? How do we walk more, in Paul's phrase, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit? Well, can I suggest something very simple in conclusion? Why not take Peter's comment, which is our verse for the year, and which is Peter, 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Uh, and then, together with that, remember Jesus' teaching in Luke 11, verse 13, and pray accordingly to be able to obey Peter's advice. For Jesus said, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will, this year, send afresh on all, us all, individually and as a church, your Holy Spirit, to be able to humble ourselves, to obey you in whatever you are calling us to be or to do, and also to be able to cast all our anxieties in these difficult days on you, for Jesus' sake. Amen.